Um, good morning, everyone. Or um, back at home, you uh, 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 or where you are, it's like um, we can say good afternoon. Uh, uh, today we are going to talk about the uh, restoration of nautically treated teeth, uh, looking into evidence from different perspective. Uh, 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 I'm going to be lecturing this uh, 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 presentation for you today. Allow me first to introduce myself. My name is Ahmed Khairi Morsi. I'm an Egyptian dentist. Uh, I'm, an, uh, 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 I'm holding a bachelor's degree uh, in dental surgery since 2011 from Cairo University in Egypt. And uh, uh, I was a former uh, uh, master degree candidate at the, at the Department of Prothodontics uh, uh, at the same university, but now I am doing a master degree uh, uh, also in, uh, in restorative dentistry in the, at the Department of Conservative Dentistry from Cairo University. And a, uh, I am one of the board members of uh, Tomorrow Tooth Academy. I'm sure uh, a lot of you people are, are uh, uh, already know about the uh, Tomorrow Tooth Academy. Uh, uh, here's my personal uh, 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 info if you want to contact me after the presentation. Uh, before I start, I would like to, uh, to uh, thank my friend Dr. Neeraj uh, and the World Dental Association Group for hosting me today. Uh, well, for a long time I want to, uh, to be in, uh, in India and to uh, visit Taj Mahal, but uh, I know it's, it has been difficult, it, it has been difficult times nowadays. Uh, let's hope it ends soon, but I still have his present for the Taj Mahal, so I thank him for it. Um, well, before I start, I wanted to uh, uh, give a little bit of an, um, uh, uh, an outline about what I want to, to, to speak about today. Well, I want to combine the clinical practice with the best available evidence that we have nowadays. And actually, it's not just about evidence. I'm saying or I'm showing my interpretation of the current evidence. Uh, 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 so what's all about the evidence-based medicine or evidence-based dentistry? It's like we want to use the most reasonable and uh, best available evidence for decision-making for, for, uh, for the care of our patients. Well, evidence-based medicine or evidence-based dentistry, it integrates the clinical experience and the patient's values with the best available research information. And that's what we want to do. We want to do an efficient literature search uh, searching and to, apply, to apply the former rules uh, uh, of evidence in evaluating the clinical literature. So basically we do not just use one paper or uh, any type of paper. We want, we want it to be patient-centered, patient-relevant. And of course, and in vivo studies, RCTs and systematic reviews, that's the best or the uh, highest available evidence. Also, uh, uh, the best available evidence sometimes it depends on many factors. Maybe, or we can say that the gold standard of care is even variable or changeable. Maybe by the emergence of a new gold standard or even the availability of skills, tools, and devices to properly implement the, this gold standard of care. So if I'm saying, for instance, that Injection molding technique is better than layering technique. If you don't have the composite heater, if you are not using magnification, if you cannot, uh, if you cannot remove the bacterial biofilm, then maybe it's not the gold standard. If someone uh, cannot use rubber dam isolation, maybe the amalgam is the gold standard for him. That's why I'm saying this, that the gold standard can be changeable. It can be uh, 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 variable based on different circumstances. And also, we have to know that not every available evidence that we have in our disposal can we can have a clinical recommendation from. We have to do proper critical appraisal. We have to uh, uh, look at the insights of the of the study, making sure it's relevant, it's patient centered, so we can take it for uh, 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 usage as a clinical guideline. Okay. So, what's the table of content for our lecture today? We will talk about the tooth status after endodontic treatment. And then we will talk about the necessity of cuspal coverage. Is it really a big deal? And then we will talk about feral and feral effect. And then we will talk about the pericervical dentine importance and preservation. And, of course, the preservation of tooth structure. So, let's start.
First, we will talk about the tooth status after endodontic treatment. And here we, have, we are having a systematic review of literature talking about the composition and the micro and macro structure alteration. So basically, in this systematic review, we have a, a very, very important and interesting conclusion that the, actually the impact of losing vitality doesn't affect the tooth structure. So we can have a lot of necrotic teeth and it, it doesn't break. However, when you do the endodontic treatment, when you do your access cavity, when you are doing your uh, uh, instrumentation, chemomechanical instrumentation using of chelators, something like the sodium hypochloride, the EDTA, and different kinds of irrigants, you are having maybe some problems. You are having, you are doing some sort of weakening of the tooth structure. So actually, what I'm saying is that it is not about the loss of vitality, it's about what we are doing in the endodontic treatment, which is something that we have to do eventually. We have to do endodontic treatment, but we have to do it as minimal as possible. We shouldn't increase the size of our access cavity. We shouldn't increase the size of uh, 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 the instrumentation uh, about the taper of the files. I should go for taper 04 rather than taper 06 and many other things. Uh, um, that's how we do, or that's what we have to do to stop any uh, uh, further uh, weakening of the tooth structure, which is very important. And then we will talk about the necessity of cuspal coverage. Is it really a big deal? And here is another systematic review uh, uh, talking about the single crown on endodontically treated teeth. This systematic review, however, only has one uh, included inside, inside it, one systematic review, uh, uh, only inc including one uh, uh, randomized control trial uh, uh, with high risk of bias. So we, we have to take its uh, 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 conclusion with caution. That's what I have to say about it. But it is really important and it's really relevant to what we see in our practice. Here it said that after 10 years follow-up, after 10 years follow-up, teeth uh, uh, covered with crowns had, after 10 years, 81% survival rate, plus or minus 12%. We can see here in this section, in this area. And if you didn't, if you don't do uh, 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 crown or crown coverage, you will have uh, uh, a success rate of 63.63% uh, uh, plus or minus 15% after 10 years follow up. And there is a huge significant difference between both numbers, which is really critical. And actually, even if it, even if it doesn't uh, 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 happen that way, we actually see it in our clinical practice. A lot of teeth, a lot of teeth uh, uh, we saw after we do endodontic treatment and the patient doesn't come to, uh, uh, for any sort of cuspal coverage, either overlays, endocrowns, or even crowns, we end up with a tooth fracture. It happens a lot, actually. So why why does it ha why does it happen? Why why does teeth break after endodontic treatment? See, you can you can see here when a functional cusp is directed to the restoration, you have some sort of deflection. You have the buccal cusp, as I'm showing here with my cursor. The buccal cusp is going more to the buccal, and the lingual cusp is going more to the lingual. So you are having some sort of a, a deflective force or a splitting force. And this kind of splitting force is actually what's causing the fracture. So if you have this cavity depth, if it's a normal cavity, like tooth without an auto treatment, it's like over here. So the arm, this arm that the deflection is happening along is a short arm. So the resistance form of the tooth is good. However, if it's an endodontically treated teeth, like we are showing, Oh, all right. Let me see. Yeah. Like we are showing right here, the arm is too long. It started from the cusp tip up to the floor of the pulp chamber. And this arm is so long that when deflection has happened, the force is even magnified. And maybe you are lucky and you're having a fracture at the base of the cusp because in a lot of time, it happens vertically. As you can see here, we are seeing a splitting in this tooth and 
and this one too. And as you can see, this kind of a splitting is what we have. If you don't, if you have a very, very wide cavity, if you are having a, a tooth that is endodontically treated without proper cuspal coverage and the tooth structure uh, 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 losing a lot uh, of, of the uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, factors, uh, which we will, are going to talk about right now. So, the cuspal coverage actually, maybe maybe it's done in different forms. It, we can do it in a full coverage crowns, we can do it in endocrowns, we can do it in overlays, or even direct overlays, we can do it with composite if you lower your cusp uh, uh, tips. So, and covered with compo with the restorations, so the direction of force will be trans uh, transformed from the restoration to the tooth structure is an, in a compressive way rather than in a deflective way. So let me let me show it here. I'm going. I'm scrolling back. Yes. All right. So here, if you lower the cusp, as in the second photo. You can, the, the, you can, and then you can put your restoration here. Uh -huh. Wait. Okay. Yes. And you can, you, you lower the cost, and then you cover it with, with, with the restoration, whatever the type of restoration is, and the force is directed occlusally. Then the force will be translated or transformed to the tooth in a compressive rather than in a deflective way. All right. Let's continue. Oh, here I was doing just an overlay after endodontic treatment. And here's when I did after isolation, cementation of the overlay. And here is the final outcome. And after one year follow-up. And here's the uh, 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 ready graph for it after one year. Another case, I did rubber dam isolation, I did pre endodontic buildup, I did the endodontic treatment, and I did the uh, uh, obturation phase, and then I lowered the cusps, actually, then I put the final restoration. So basically, what are the factors that should govern us if we are going to decide whether we are going to do cuspal coverage or not? First, let me finish the, the case. Impression taking, cementation of the Emax overlay, and here's the restoration after cementation. So here, I protected the tooth against fracture. So, and here's the x-ray after cementation. So, what are the, uh, uh, um, we can say the, um, the, um, the factors or the uh, uh, risk factors to govern us whether to do cuspic coverage or not? First, uh, uh, the depth of the cavity, is it endodontically treated or not? Second, the presence of marginal ridges. The marginal ridges are so important because they, they hold the buccal and lingual cusps together to prevent the risk of slippage or decrease the risk of slippage. So the presence or absence of, mar of marginal ridges is critical. The third one is the width of the cavity. So what is the thickness of the cusps? If the cusp thickness is less than two to 2.5 millimeters, that's a risk factor that you should consider doing cuspal coverage. Also, the connection between the cavities. So basically, if I'm having two cavities on the same tooth, I should maintain as much tooth structure in between as possible. I shouldn't go for connection of both cavities. Actually, this will hold the tooth. It will act as a truss or as a bridge that holds the buccal and lingual cusps together so I can decrease the amount or the, uh, uh, the forces of deflection that will cause the tooth to even go and split. Okay, so to do it directly or indirect, if I'm going for a composite restoration, for instance, and the patient cannot afford for a, an all ceramic uh, 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 approach, sometimes I can go for composite. Okay, so if I'm going for composite, should I go for a direct approach or an indirect approach. Here is a systematic review and meta-analysis comparing both techniques. Does it really uh, matter or not? And we can see from the conclusion that the difference between the both techniques 
didn't reach statistical significance in order to recommend one technique over the other. And the scarcity of the system of this uh, of the primary studies supports the need for a further well-designed long-term studies. However, we have more than seven systematic reviews having the same conclusions about this topic. So if you can do it, you can do it direct, you can do it in, in, in an indirect approach. It depends, it really depends on other factors such as the uh, 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 your your decision as a clinician and your patient uh, uh, decision uh, uh, if he cannot open his mouth for a long time maybe uh, uh, your lab support is good if your lab support uh, or your lab accuracy is not good you can go for direct approach it's about your preference do you prefer to do it directly or indirect so the factor it's not about the polymerization shrinkage or the um, or the uh, 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 cuspal deflection uh, due to uh, 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 polymerization shrinkage stresses. No, it doesn't. It doesn't uh, uh, happen about this. About all uh, uh, the parameters that being tested uh, 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 to compare the direct versus indirect approach, they are all the same. All right. Now let's talk about the ferro and the ferro effect. So, what is actually the ferro? The ferro is the band that encircles the external dimension of the residual tooth structure. Okay, so basically, how much ferrule do we need? We have two things. We have the ferrule height and the ferrule width. You can see right here, we have this height, which minimally should be 1.5 to 2 millimeters, and the width of the ferrule, which should be minimal, uh, minimal uh, 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 the minimum uh, requirement should be one millimeter. So, so, so we can have a ferrule effect. But the question is, do this ferrule should be 360 degrees? Should we have it uh, 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 to encircle the whole tooth? Or it may be uh, uh, just uh, we need it on predominantly in one area and the other areas maybe not that critical. Let's see. So as we said, the ferrule effect should be 1.5 to 2 millimeters width and one millimeter at, le uh, at least, uh, uh, or uh, so I mean 1.5 to 2 millimeters in height and at least one millimeter what? That, and that brings us to the point of saving the peri-cervical dentine area, which means if we can see here, if I can, here I, we did a shoulder finish line, but if we can, if I can preserve this area and doing a conservative crown preparation, something like a vertical preparation, I'm actually saving more pericervical dentine and I am saving more, or I'm, I'm, I'm adding more ferrule to the tooth structure, which is a very good benefit. And that's why when we are talking about the uh, uh, vertical preparation technique, we are not just talking about uh, 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 a trend, it's a philosophy. When I'm saving this area, when I'm saving this area, actually I'm saving a lot for the tooth structure. And I'm giving a, a more resistance form for the tooth to prevent any fracture or uh, 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 necking of the crown. So let's see. Here I did a shoulder finish line and I was doing a very good shoulders back, back in the days. But actually, if I can save all of this tooth structure, that would have been much better for this tooth, especially... Uh, this tooth is endodontically treated. So basically here, I maybe have a, a good ferrule, but, but I don't have a good ferrule effect at all. That's uh, uh, what sometimes I, I consider the perfection of the idiot. When I do such aggressive crown preparation, I'm sacrificing a lot of the tooth structure. That's not a good thing. Maybe good to brag with my dental friends, with my uh, 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 friends who are uh, in the dental field about how good my preparation is, but this is not... For, uh, uh, a good uh, line of treatment for my patients. So you can see here, I did uh, 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 a vertical preparation. You can see the amount of the tooth structure that's being preserved here and here. You can see how much of the tooth structure is being saved, actually, by saving uh, or giving the tooth uh, 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 more resistance by thickening of the ferrule and preserving the pericervical dentine area. So, let's, the, let's uh, go for the other question. Does the ferrule need to be uh, 360 degrees? Let's see. Here is a, uh, 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 a study 
that was uh, 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 comparing the effect of different partial feral locations on the fracture resistance of endontically treated teeth. And if we can see here, he, uh, 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 that it was an in vitro study. Maybe it's not the it, it, one of the base uh, uh, line papers. Uh, the hierarchy of evidence, it's in the base of the hierarchy, but we can have a very good insight about what's going on regarding partial feral nature. So here you can see in this in this one, you have a complete 360 degrees feral. Here it's only on the palatal wall, here it's only on the buccal, here it's only on the proximal, and here with no feral at all. If we can see, and then the load was applied from the palatal surface, as you can see here, and we can see that here, the point B, we have the furrow, and here it's on the buccal wall. And let's see what the numbers tell us. You can see here that in the complete, the force needed on the complete furrow, the force needed to dislodge the crown was 803 megapascal. And here it was 747 if we have it on the palatal wall only. So, if you, if, you can, if, you can, if we can compare between the complete and the palatal uh, 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 feral, there is no significant difference between both. That's emphasized the importance of the palatal wall uh, uh, feral for the upper teeth and the buccal wall for the lower teeth. If we are having a normal relationship between upper and lower teeth, if you are having a cross-bite relation, you are going to shift it. You are going to make the buccal wall of the upper and the palatal wall of the lower, if it's in a cross-bite relation. But we are talking about the normal relation. The most important wall for the furrow on the upper teeth is the palatal wall. In the lower, it's in on the buccal wall. But if we are having the palatal furrow only on the facial uh, 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 surface of the upper teeth, you can see that the force reduced significantly. It went up to 60 percent lower, which makes a lot of sense. So the resistance has to be from the tooth structure on the beginning. If you put the force on the restoration or on the post, it's going to dislodge or go, it's going to fracture either the restoration or the tooth. Of course, the law, the lowest uh, values was when, when there is no feral at all, when you can see here, there is no feral at all. So the forces, uh, uh, so the, uh, the force uh, of dislodgement reduced significantly. As you can see, the highest level is when you are having a 360 degree, degree ferrule, uh, uh, the palatal wall is the most important and the most predominant one, as we can see right here. If we have it only on the buccal or on the interproximal, it decreases significantly. That's why you have to have a palatal ferrule at least. All right, so let's talk about the pericervical dentine. So basically, what is the definition of the pericervical dentine area? Well, it's an eight millimeters, four millimeters supracrystal and four millimeters in, uh, uh, infrabony here. All of this is considered the pericervical dentine area. Basically, it is the neck of the tooth. Okay, and here actually is the most uh, 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 part that gets fractured when we can see a lot of crowns that being dislodged or fracturing the, the core or the crown, you can see that the fracture mainly or predominantly happening is happening here. So why I'm saying so? Because this is giving the tooth its resistance form. So when you are doing your axis cavity and you are gouging this dentine area, you are losing a lot of pericervical dentine. And we are doing your crown preparation and you are doing shoulder crown preparation as in here, you are sacrificing a lot on the uh, 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 pericervical dentine from the external outline. So if you can see here in this, in this photo, if I did a, a large axis cavity, if I did, which I didn't, if I did a large axis cavity and I did shoulder finish line, what about the feral effect? How much of the tooth structure did I preserve? Maybe uh, I'm having a good height, but a very minimal width which is not the right way to do it. But we, if we can see here, if I did uh, um, a vertical preparation, for instance, 
I'm saving the whole width of the pericervical dentine. I'm not talking about the uh, interproximal surface. It's going to be removed with doing the crown preparation. But if you do not do finish line as in here, you can see that you saved all of this area. This area, all, all of this area is, is being saved by doing just uh, a very minimal uh, or very conservative crown preparation, which is critical to give the tooth a resistance form against fracture, especially after endontic treatment. We all know that uh, the risk of fracture is very high. And also, if you can see, when you are doing a conservative axis cavity, as in here, I didn't gouge on the uh, 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 dentinal walls in the internal architecture, and also, uh, uh, do when I do the uh, 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 the cana root canal preparation, only the, you can see the palatal is very wide because it was originally very wide. I didn't over widening it. Uh, I was going uh, like crazy with the files, and it, it, the file was like playing inside the canal because it was very wide already. But here I was just ending up my preparation at 3004, which is pretty conservative. It's not that. Uh, 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 the, the cutting is not that uh, very high. Now, let's talk about ferrule versus post. Which is more important? Is it about the ferrule is it, or is it about the post? This was about an in vitro study talking about the importance or uh, 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 comparing the ferrule effect versus fiber post, not metal posts. And we will talk about this issue later. And actually, the survival of the broken down uh, uh, non-vital incisors was improved by the presence of the ferrule, but not by the fiber reinforced posts. It all, it's all about the ferrule, guys. It's not about the post at all. Fiber posts were always detrimental to the failure mode and were not able to compensate for the absence of ferrule whatsoever. So it's all about having ferrule. So when we, we are doing... Uh, 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 any sort of uh, post and core, we should have a part of sound tooth structure that the crown margins will stop on. And then let's go for the highest form of evidence. We go. Uh, we will talk about the feral comes first, post is second, fake news and alternative facts, which is a systematic review, which is a very, very important systematic review, actually. We can see here that in total, that in the, con in the discussion of the Systematic review that seven out of eight uh, 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 papers, RCTs and prospective clinical trial, only one show a post effect, a post, a positive post effect. The eight show negative post effect. It's all about the ferrule, as we said. And what is even more interesting, what is even more interesting, that the only study that limit. Uh, 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 or it said that the post may be have an impact or have a uh, 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 an importance. They limited the post importance only to the cast metal posts or the prefabricated metal posts, not the fiber posts at all. So basically, if you are having a compromised ferrule, you should go for either cast metal posts, with which is your uh, uh, best uh, available. Uh, uh, option or uh, to use the ready-made titanium posts, not going for uh, 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 fiber posts at all. So basically, of course, uh, a lot of people, what, what are you saying? We all know that the fiber post is even better than the, uh, uh, the fiber posts, but bear with me. Uh, uh, as we said, that the most predominant factor is the ferrule. If you are having ferrule, the post, whether it's metal or whether it's fiber, it doesn't have any impact on the survival rate of the restoration or the tooth. Uh, uh, but if you don't have ferrule, the only option that you can have or the po type of post that you can use is the metal post because you need to brace the restoration with the tooth structure, not doing something that is bending more than the tooth structure. So basically, when, what we were studying uh, uh, back in days that the fiber posts having the similar modulus of elasticity of the tooth structure. And actually, this is not true because the modulus of elasticity is thickness dependent. And what I mean by my words is 
if you want the fiber post to have a similar modulus of elasticity uh, of the dentin, you should have the same thickness. So basically, you have to drill a lot and you have to, rem to remove a lot of tooth structure in order to put a fiber post that have the similar thickness of the dentin so they can bend like each other so you don't have an overbending from the fiber post and debonding as a secular, which we see a lot. But uh, we cannot do that because you will sacrifice a lot of a very important tissue, which is the pericervical dentine area. So we cannot do this, actually. Um, so we said that this point is it's not important, actually, about the, the modulus of elasticity. And about we can talk about also adhesion. We can, talk, we can talk about the monoblock effect that we can have from the fiber posts. And actually, it's not true either because... If we know, and we uh, and, and, and I think you all know about this, that adhesion to dentin is heavily compromised. Even if it's not compromised immediately, it's compromised after if maybe one or two years. You have MMPs, uh, matrix metalloproteinases enzymes, uh, that is uh, uh, de de deteriorating the adhesive interface. You're having a, a bone degradation uh, uh, after this period of time you lose maybe 30 to 70% of the team bonding after only one year due to, uh, as I said, the MMPs, in, uh, 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 MMPs activation and the bond degradation. So basically, it is not about the bonding. It's not about the modules of elasticity. It's about supporting, or maybe it's not, and it's not about the supporting of tooth structure. It's about supporting of the restoration. It's about giving reinforcement for the restoration against bending forces and we will talk about this later this systematic review was talking about the survival rate of endontically treated teeth with fiber post supported and actually the conclusion was the same that even with all the advantages we can see here in the last conclusion even with all the advantages it cannot it couldn't be told that fiber posts are better than metal as clinical studies result showed as well good outcomes of teeth result with metal posts. But, you know, sometimes we can be biased. Uh, 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 anyways, th that and that's the words of the author. Anyways, glass or quartz fiber, po uh, uh, fiber posts are good alternatives for metal posts. You can use both, but we cannot say it's better than the metal posts. And here is another systematic review comparing, actually, it, the, they are here comparing between the fiber and metal posts. And they said that the metal post, and uh, compared with uh, uh, using metal post, the survival rate of the teeth uh, having fiber post have a significantly higher, and uh, uh, and root fracture rate is significantly lower if you are using fiber posts. However, if and we and we should read carefully. However, the conclusion is limited by the lack of relevant studies, small sample size, so it is not. Uh, uh, um, Represented, uh, representable or representative for the population and inadequate quality and diversified methodology. So we, if, we take, if we took this conclusion, we have to take it with caution. It is not uh, 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 a, a bare uh, um, truth and we should believe it. That's very important. And here, if we can see this, we, they compare uh, a comparison of fracture resistance between cast, a cast post and fiber posts a meta-analysis of literature. <coughs> and we can see here in the uh, uh, in this area, and we can see this uh, in the meta-analysis and in this first plot, and you can see that the diamond uh, 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 part is crossing the line of no effect, and that's here you can know that there is no statistical significance between using metal posts or fiber posts. But doctors, uh, uh, and that's a raising question that we are all have. When we put metal posts, we always end up with fracture, right? First, let's end this, this recommendation here. Fiber post can be used when ample coronal dentine remains. And that's what we were saying. If you already have a dentin or having a, a, a ferro, you, you can put either metal or fiber. It doesn't matter. But cast metal posts must may be used when the tooth, when there is moderate to severe tooth loss. And that's what we were talking about 
if you are having a compromised ferrule, you have to go for cast posts. Because the bonding of the post to the two structure can improve the prognosis, yes, but if you are having a load, a very high load, it will debond and it also may fracture the tooth. So let, that brings us actually to the function of the post. Is it to support the tooth structure? Is it to retain the core or is it to stiffen the core? Let's look. Of course, what we, from what we were saying and from the evidence that we were talking about, if you are using the post to support tooth structure, you are totally wrong. Because in order to put a post, you are drilling, you are removing from the tooth structure. And what, from what we know, that in order to support tooth structure, you have to leave tooth structure. The only thing that supports the tooth is the tooth. Okay? So, if you don't put a post, that's even better for the tooth. Okay. So, is it to retain the core? Um, well, that is a tricky one. But, actually, no. If you're having a good circumferential enamel surface, you don't have, you don't have to... Uh, uh, rely on the post for adhesion or for retaining of the core. So it is uh, if you are having a, a gross uh, tooth, stru uh, tooth structure loss, maybe it will help with retaining the core. But rather than this, you already have adhesion. You don't have to rely on the retaining of the core using a post. But is it to stiffen the core? So. Basically, if you are having a large composite core, it's still, it's a plastic, it still bends. So let's, let's look, at, look at it in a different uh, way. If you're having a, um, uh, 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 if, if, you are, if you are doing some sort of constructions and you put a, uh, 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 a plastic, uh, uh, um, uh, what's say, a plastic rods rather than metal rods, which will support the 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 uh, the wall more? Is it the metal or the plastic? Of course, the metal. The metal is giving uh, the bracement. is giving a, uh, a strength. I mean, it's like putting a, met a metal core inside a plastic uh, inside a plastic core. It will give it the strength I want to. But what is more important, and what what we were talking about uh, uh, um, about the um, whether the, the metal posts fracture the tooth or not. Actually, which size should we use and how we use it? Which size which should we use? It's the size that you don't have to drill for it. That's very important. And what I mean by my, with my words is that we remove only the gutta persia, only the gutta persia and evaluate the size of the root canal and choose the post size based on this. And the second most important thing, and the second most important thing, that you don't screw the post. We put it in a passive fit, which means when I put it, I remove it, it only touches the walls of the, of the root canal, not, uh, uh, not screwing it inside. And if, because if you screw it, you are going to cause a stress accumulation and stress concentration on the tooth structure even without the teething uh, uh, contacting for occlusion. Because if you, if you screw it and the patient is occluding on the tooth, it will even creating more stresses and even cr fracturing the tooth structure. So the most important factor is not to drill for the post and, and not to screw the post. And actually, we do not use it for retention anymore, so you don't have to go for the two-third or even one, one half of the root canal length. You can put it just four to five millimeters because you want most of the post to be inside the core rather than inside the root canal system. All right. Let's talk about the reduction in the tooth stiffness. Uh, let's talk about the preservation of the tooth structure and talking about reduction in the tooth stif stiffness as a result of endodontic and restorative procedures. And here you can see that the highest values was in, 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 in the teeth that were unaltered. Of course, if you do the axis, you are having uh, uh, decreasing the, the strength. If you do an instrumentation, you are further decreasing. But actually, what is more important is that when we have the MODs, cavities, 
you have a reduction in the strength by 60 to 65 uh, percent of the tooth structure mechanical properties and actually this is alarming and that's what we were saying about uh, um, that losing both marginal ridges have significantly affect the strength of the tooth structure and actually from here we will talk about uh, uh, the, conserva the, the impact of the conservation of the tooth structure. So here we will talk about the fracture strength of endontically treated teeth with different axis designs. And from here we can say, we can see that the values in the traditional axis here, it's the traditional endodontic, uh, our traditional axis cavities, here is the conservative and here is the ninja axis. The difference between the traditional and conservative is significant. That's, and that's in, uh, what we were saying about preserving the tooth structure. If I'm having a smaller axis cavity, that's even better for the tooth. Uh, but this to a limit, I'm not talking about doing an ninja axis or like just pin, uh, pin drops on the uh, 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 pulp chamber, but I'm talking about a more conservative axis. I don't have to see all the canals from different directions as we were taught back in days. No, you have to make it as conservative as possible. And if you can do it, and, and in order to do it conservatively, actually you have to do it using, and you have to use magnification in order to, mag to use, to see the uh, uh, root canal systems uh, uh, quite obviously without the need for, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 to over widen the axis cavity. Okay, uh, uh, let me have a just one minute break. I'm going to be back to you. I'm sorry for, for the interruption. I had to open the door. Um, so here we can see that the uh, uh, um, that preserving tooth structure is critical. And here we can see that the conservative axis uh, cavity was even better uh, or improving the fracture resistance of the tooth structure more than the traditional axis because the traditional axis you are removing a lot of the tooth structure. But you don't have to go for the.
I yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, you you okay. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, guys, we are back. I guess, right? Um Uh, guys, can you hear me? All right, uh, we are back. I'm sorry for the uh, for the disruption. Okay, so all right, wait, uh, Doctor Neil, I think I'm I'm back. All right, I think I think I'm back. Right? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, you are, yeah. You are, you are back. Okay. Thank you. Started. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, let's continue. Um, so here you can see what I did is conservative axis cavity, but not only this, it's a carriage driven axis. If you can see here, that's how I go and do the root canal system from this direction. And here is after I put the restoration. 
So actually, I preserved a lot of the tooth structure in this area rather than losing all of this uh, uh, if I'm going to do a traditional access cavity. And also, uh, uh, um, maybe I'm not the right guy to talk about endodontic treatment uh, or about the access cavity, but now we are, li we are living in the era of uh, um, controlled memory files. Uh, uh, we are not using stiff files anymore, so I'm not uh, uh, that afraid about the torquing of the file or having a risk of fracture of the uh, uh, of the files of the rotary files I'm using. Uh, uh, but actually, I'm preserving a lot of the tooth structure, which is which matters the most. Even if I'm going to go for crown preparation or even going for any sort of indirect preparation, you have to preserve and you have to appreciate the amount of tooth structure that's being left. That's not a bad thing. And here's the x-ray for the root canal system. Another case, I did the endodontic treatment, and you can see from here the axis cavity, and that's the direction. If I'm going to do a traditional axis, I have to cut through the whole this area in order to uh, make a traditional axis and have a straight, a straight path for the root canals. Rather, I preserved this area. I did my root canal system, uh, my root canal treatment, and then I restored the tooth. And of course, this tooth had to be it has to receive a cuspid coverage. So we did we did a crown after we finished the restoration. But the amount of tooth structure underneath the crown is also critical. And here is after we put the final restoration, and here is the contour of the restoration. And here's the x-ray from here and also i want to uh, uh, say something here you can see that the amount of pericervical dentine is that is being preserved is critical that's why i didn't go for uh, uh, a very large size and I, I'm, to be honest i i, I don't use any uh, uh, orifice openers anymore i merely use uh, 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 just maybe a tip of uh, 2506 as just to guide me through the canals I don't have to use orifice openers, and I'm also using magnification. I'm working with a direct operating microscope, so uh, uh, it's not that big of a deal to over-widen or over-flare the canal uh, uh, coronally because I want to preserve the, amount, um, the most amount of pericervical dentine area as possible in this area. So, uh, uh, we, we uh, um, I don't know if you, if you see this, but we have this. Uh, 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 heated discussion a lot about the the effect of trust and how uh, 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 a lot of groups and a lot of uh, uh, board members in different groups are having some heated discussion and even uh, 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 our friends uh, that doing uh, uh, trust access or believing in trust access and uh, these types of axes and uh, this was an in vitro study and and actually both are claiming to be to be true and from where I stand uh, um, actually, I do believe that it has an impact on the tooth structure and, and to preserve and to uh, decrease the deflection load by leaving a truss panel uh, uh, between the buccal and lingual walls. So let's see here. This was a, uh, an in vitro study done by Dr. Mohazal Khawas and Dr. Ashraf Samir uh, uh, uh and Dr. Kim. And uh, uh, both Dr. Mohazal Khawas and Dr. Ashraf are my professors. And actually, they, they, uh, they were measuring the impact of trust and also artificial trust by putting uh, some sort of a, uh, a post or a restoration uh, uh, right here. Let me see. Yes, in this area. So they, they wanted to see if there is an, uh, an impact for the artificial trust by creating artificial trust, with, whether it's going to uh, uh, strengthen the tooth or not. And the results actually were uh, uh, interesting. Because the it, of course the traditional axis, it has uh, uh, we can see here that the truss axis actually has the highest value more than the traditional axis cavity, and more than the artificial truss. So the the uh, creating an artificial truss, it's not important at all. But having a truss of dental, as in this photo, we can see here. In the photo number uh, A, this is a traditional axis. Here is the uh, 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 truss axis cavity, and here is the artificial truss. Here has the highest value for fracture resistance. 
And actually, of course, these numbers are from in vitro studies under the universal testing machines, which cannot we cannot have a clinical recommendation out of it, but it gives us an insight about increasing the fracture toughness and the fracture resistance of the tooth structure by leaving a truss in between the buccal and lingual walls. But we should have, or we should uh, uh, um, uh, uh, maybe have a very important recommendation for it, because here, actually, the conclusion was, it can be concluded that the truss, the, the truss axis cavity preparation improved the fracture resistance, yes, but uh, uh, the artificial trust didn't. Uh, um, however, that the authors highly recommend the use of comb beam CT before doing such type of axes. And of course, using magnification, that, that's for sure. So if you are going to go for truss axis, you have to make sure that you are using a comb beam CT to know the, the placement or the position of the root canals in case you are having a um, an accessory root canal like in uh, uh, um, uh, can having a, a, a maybe like a radix intomolaris or radix para paramolaris so you have to know if you are having an accessory root canal uh, 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 within your uh, 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 ca within your axis cavity okay and here is how we can use, we can clean be beneath the truss by using a, a, an ultrasonic tips uh, 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 to clean below the truss axis. And here is the same the same thing. But here you can see that the amount of tooth structure that's being preserved in between the buccal and lingual wall that will prevent that with, it will act as an, an it will act as emulsion ridge too. Okay, let me have some uh, uh, questions. Um, wait. Okay. 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 We'll we will we will uh, uh, answer the questions at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, uh, presentation, guys. Okay. Don't worry. And here, I did my pre endodontic buildup first, and then. I think there's a problem. Wait a minute, guys. I think there's a. Uh, um, oh, okay, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. We will finish this case uh, uh, afterwards. It's going to be there uh, when we are doing the, oh, we're talking about the vertical preparation, okay? So, here, if you can see that this amount of tooth structure that being preserved is critical. So, I'm already, ha I'm already losing both margin ridges, which is catastrophic for the tooth structure. So if I'm going to lose this area too, the forces that may cause splitting of the buccal and lingual wall will be magnified. And as I said, or as, as I uh, uh, showed you the paper that showed that the MOD cavities had the worst prognosis. Okay, and now let's talk about even further uh, uh, preserving of the tooth structure by doing a vertical preparation technique rather than shoulder or chamfer preparation. So here, that's the amount of tooth structure that you are re removing on the line, on the blue line. That's the amount of tooth structure that you are losing if you are doing the shoulder preparation. And here's the amount that you are losing if you are doing the vertical preparation. And actually, this is taking a lot from your ferrule. And, and we should note this. And also, if you are doing an endodontic treatment, which happens more frequently, if you are doing crowns, basically you are doing it because you did and in long treatment, and you did some gouging right here, you are losing a lot from the peri-cervical dentine area. And that's the importance of the vertical preparation technique. But I know we are having uh, uh, a lot of heated discussion about the worthiness and the uh, uh, um, 
and about some problems that uh, uh, we might talk about during the vertical preparation technique and which material to use and uh, um, which technique and how to do it and how to contact the lab. Of course, uh, uh, my presentation is maybe limited in this, uh, uh, in, in this area, but we will talk as much as we can about it. So in vertical preparation, simply you are not, you, you are not doing a finish line. Maybe you are creating something called a finish area, as in the shoulderless approach, which makes, if we can see this area in this, in this uh, photo, you're having an edge. If you can see this point, after it, you are having an undercut. So this is your edge. That's, that's, we call it an edge preparation or shoulderless approach. But here, you are having a, what we can call an edgeless approach, that you're having a straight line up to the level of the bone, so basically, we are all when we are doing our preparation, we mainly go for the edge preparation or the shoulders approach. We only go for the edges approach when the ferrule is being compromised. That's why you need to engage as much tooth structure as possible. So at, by this time, you have to go for the edges approach to engage sound tooth structure and to have enough ferrule. Okay, so is it was it? Uh, starting about the vertical preparation technique, aka tomorrow tooth. No, it has been uh, 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 this type of preparation has been there for, like forever. And actually, if uh, uh, if a lot of you know that before doing shoulders, people were only using vertical preparations while doing the swatching crowns back in days. It's like in the 60s and 70s and 50s they were just doing vertical preparation, but they were ending up with a lot of problems such as the problem of the material because the crowns weren't fitting uh, to the tooth structure. Uh, uh, the second problem was uh, because they, they didn't know how to do it right, they, they end up with a lot of soft tissue problems and overhanging which causes gingival inflammation and uh, 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 causing another secular that we want to avoid. But now since we are using uh, uh, more precise uh, 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 restorations. We are using CAT CAMs and different uh, uh, te uh, te uh, different uh, 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 manufacturing technologies that allow us to be more accurate so we can eliminate the problems of the vertical preparation. So basically, uh, uh, back in days, they were having a biological problem, if, if, if we put it uh, 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 like this, they were having mainly a, uh, um, a biological problem regarding the soft tissues. Uh, uh, but when they did finish lines, they had another problem. They have a mechanical problem in uh, uh, causing uh, uh, the tooth, the, th the teeth to split or to be neck to be fractured. So uh, 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 let's put both into evidence. So we will talk about the, uh, the, the one of the first techniques of the vertical preparation, which is the BOPT the biologically oriented preparation technique, which was, uh, 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 which was uh, postulated by Dr. Ignazio Loi and uh, Antonello. And for the, and the difference between the biological, uh, uh, biologically oriented preparation technique and the vertical preparation technique is actually in many steps. So they are not the same uh, uh, per se. They are different in the impression techniques. They are different in the stones being used for the preparation and even for the lab protocol. So the impression technique has to be delayed for a, for a minimum or four weeks in order to let the soft tissue to, uh, uh, to reorder itself after the preparation because it's going within the sulcus. So they want to know where the soft tissue will stop exactly and then to put the final restoration. So here, how they put the margin, how or how to put, the, how to when to choose, when to put, where to put the margin of the restoration. So you have three lines mainly. You have the uh, uh, depth of the sulcus, which is, which is here, which is uh, uh, done by the blue line, and then you have the uh, free gingival marginal level, which is in the black line, and then you put your margin in between both. So you hide your margin. Yes, you put it slightly subgingival, yes, and but you do not put it at the depth of the sulcus so you do not impinge on the uh, supracrestal tissue attachment. And I said supracrestal uh, uh, connective tissue. I didn't say biological width. And for this reason, I'm going to say uh, uh, why I said so. I didn't say the biological width. 
But in their conclusion, actually, they have the a very good stability of the pericoronal tissues. They didn't have any risk of uh, 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 recession by uh, doing the biologically oriented preparation technique. But we have some problems. From uh, uh, these problems are sometimes you have cracking in the margins of the restoration because it, it's uh, uh, it's very thin at the cervical part. So you have to create uh, uh, what we call uh, an inverted cement gap so it doesn't uh, create stress over the margin and you put how you do the uh, occlusal table on a frictional fit so you make the occlusal table as your stump as your stoppage it's like a finish line but on the occlusal table and you create an inverted cement gap on the axial walls so you prevent any pressure on the crown margins and also we have to delay the impression taking for four to six weeks, which is a lot for the patient. Maybe we can have a different approach. And from here, the uh, uh, the protocol of the of tomorrow tooth uh, uh, was there. They are having they are using a different types of burrs for preparation, such as and which is with the most important one, or both are the butt burrs, which are safe and cutting, mainly used for and long, uh, to. Uh, uh, increase the size of the non endodontic access cavity, but we use we the, uh, the tomorrow tooth uh, uh, school. They they said that if we use this, we are not going to create finish line in the first place. So we are going to be more conservative. And actually, the bad bird is even more gentle on the soft tissue, rather than using just the torpedo burr that is being used on the uh, 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 biologically oriented preparation technique. So the difference is that it, the tomorrow tooth approach is less traumatic to the periodontium and the impression taking can be done even immediately or even maybe like two weeks if you are going uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, more deep or subgingival finish lines and also a modified lab protocol to avoid chipping or, or cracking for the crown margins. So let's put this type of preparation even into evidence and which is critical. So this is a, retros a retrospective study or retrospective analysis of 100 uh, uh, zirconia single crowns with knife edge margins. And we were seeing here the uh, 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 whether the survival rate of these crowns were similar to the, uh, done with deep chamfer finish lines or not. And actually, we can see that the zirconia crowns with knife edge margins allow clinical performance similar to that reported with other margin designs, but with less invasive preparation. And that's what we were saying, that if you are doing vertical preparation, you are saving a lot of the pericervical dentine and you are saving a lot of the tooth structure, which increases the resistance form of the tooth while not jeopardizing the resistance form of the restoration. Okay. Let's talk about another aspect. We talk about the survival rate. Let's talk about the, the, the marginal fit of the restoration. Does it, does it, is it being affected by uh, doing it chamfer or vertical? And here you can see, and if you, if you read uh, what, and actually this, this paper is actually, it's really important because what, the, what basically they did is that they make crowns on patients indicated for orthodontic uh, treatment and extraction of the four force and then after they did the crowns they extract the teeth with the crowns and they uh, they uh, sectioned the teeth in order to put the uh, 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 to to measure the marginal fit under uh, uh, electron microscope and actually the results were really interesting that the marginal gap value for the vertical crown preparation was was 35.45 micrometers and uh, 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 in the uh, sh uh, the deep chamfer was 35.44. So there is no statistical significance between the two numbers and the marginal gap was similar in both restorations. And actually, if you saw, if you saw this picture, uh, I I'm just want to talk about a different aspect for the vertical preparation, which is the soft tissue. If you look at this photo, actually I did three crowns two crowns of them were done by chamfer finish line and uh, 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 one was done by using vertical preparation.
Yes. And one of them was done by vertical preparation. So if you can see here, I did, it's the same lab. It was the same uh, uh, operator, the same patient, the same oral hygiene. And if you saw the margins around the lateral here, you will appreciate the, the, uh, 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 the soft tissue healing around it. There is no redness or there is no uh, 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 marginal gingivitis around it, like as, in, as in the central and the canine. The lateral is really, really, uh, the soft tissue healing is just beyond doubt. And it's even better. And actually, it was really uh, 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 mind-blowing for me to see it, to see how the soft tissue react with the crowns uh, uh, done by, by vertical preparation. And actually, this brings us to the, uh, 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 some talking about the, uh, uh, the, the biological width and the periodontal uh, aspect of the study. So, we all know that the biological width is very important. Uh, uh, we have been studying that the biological width is a, uh, a number of uh, 2.04 millimeters, and we should respect the biological width, and we shouldn't violate the biological width. And uh, uh, from these studies, we can see, from this systematic review, we can read these conclusions, which is really important, that the biological width is not a fixed number, of course, and also treating the patient and if you can see here that, if you can see here that a magic number for the biological width as a treatment objective cannot be recommended. And what I mean by my words is, if you did, uh, uh, if you put your margins of the restoration in between or within the uh, uh, biological width or within the uh, 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 soft, within the uh, uh, the the area of what we can call the biological width may not be uh, uh, the cause of any problem, actually. Sometimes we put restorations within the biological width and nothing happened. Sometimes we, uh, 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 we do respect the biological width and still the bone is just going away. We don't know. We just don't know. It's just uh, 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 we know. I think we think we know about the biological width more than we actually know. And if we can see here in this consensus report talking about the biological width, and let's see the definition they put. Biological width is a commonly used clinical term to describe the epicoronal uh, uh, variable dimensions of the supracrystal attached tissues. The supracrystal attached tissues are histologically composed of the junctional epithelium, supracrystal connective tissue attachment, and they said that the term biological width should be replaced by the supracrystal tissue attachment. It's not the biological width anymore. And actually, if we can read this, are the changes in the periodontium caused by the infringement of restorative margin within the supracrystal connective tissue attachment due to dental plaque biofilm trauma or some other factors? And from the given available evidence, it is not possible to determine if the negative effect on the periodontium associated with the restoration margin located within the supracrystal tissue attachment is caused by dental plaque, biofilm, or trauma, or toxicity of materials, or even a combination of both. We don't know. It's actually, it's something which is really crazy. We all know that if we put the margin within the biological width, definitely it will cause a problem. But now, actually from the current evidence or from the available evidence, it is not correlated. And also that takes us to another problem or to another subject. Which factor, which criteria should we uh, 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 address during uh, doing a treatment? And from this, we have to talk about the, what is the true end point and what is the surrogate measurement. So the true end point is in medicine, if we are talking about medicine, if I give a patient uh, a treatment and he either live or die, if he lived or died, this is a true endpoint measurement. But if I cannot e uh, uh, measure uh, this as a matter of life and death, I can I can measure it in a different way. I can like um, measuring pulp uh, uh, pulse, uh, uh, the number of pulse, or a um, or the uh, uh, um, is, um, I'm using the uh, or uh, measuring the blood pressure. This is called a surrogate measurement. Okay, that gives us an indication about the overall quality of the treatment that we give to our patient. So what are the true endpoint 
versus the surrogate measurement in periodontology. And from this paper, we can see that the surrogate measurement is like bleeding or probing. So is bleeding or probing important? It gives us an indication. It may not be uh, uh, the, uh, um, it, not, it, may be, it may be gives us an indication about the periodontal health, but it's not a detrimental factor. Uh, probing depth, same thing, CGF, more, uh, uh, the uh, growth uh, or curricular, uh, 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 or uh, uh, we call it the uh, uh, growth factors uh, or uh, microbial load or infrabony effects or position of gingival margins, unless it affects the patient. So if we can see here, the true endpoints were bleeding on brushing. So if we are talking about the patient centered or the patient relevant outcomes. Uh, bleeding, on, uh, bleeding on brushing, pain, affecting the masticatory efficiency, causing halitosis or uh, uh, the uh, uh, or the uh, any recession of the gingival margin that occurs. So these are the criteria that is really important for, for, for us rather than the surrogate endpoints. And from this, we have to see that if the if we can if we measure both true and surrogate measurements and the surrogate, surrogate measurement was positive and it indicating a problem while the true endpoint is not there is no problem with it we should discard the surrogate measurement so from this we can look at this study clinical periodontal response to anterior all ceramic crowns either chamfer or feather edge here we were talking about subgingival margins and if we can read this that there is more bleeding on probing around feather edge, around the vertical, if we are using feather edge or, or vertical crown preparation, which is a surrogate measurement, as I already stated, while in deep chamfer, the risk of gingival recession increased. And that is uh, uh, really interesting, that bleeding and probing is not as important as uh, uh, um, gingival recession. The gingival recession is far more important for me and for my patient. And that's why from this from this study, I can say that, oh, if I'm, I'm going to have bleeding or probing, it's okay. I'm gonna, I, can, I, can, I can live with that, and my patient can live with that. He can just uh, brush his teeth uh, regularly, and he can just uh, um, uh, uh, prevent uh, any uh, plaque accumulation. So we will not have uh, so much of a problem using uh, 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 crowns with vertical preparation, but not having a gingival recession if I'm going to use deep chamfer finish lines, subgingival. And back to this photo, I did here a deep chamfer, and you can see here the soft tissue response around the crown, and here too, while in the vertical preparation, the soft tissue was even more or even better. Back in this time, I was really skeptical about vertical preparation, and I only did it because this tooth was heavily compromised, and if I did shoulder or deep chamfer finish line, the tooth would, would have been lost. That's why I went for vertical prevention, and I was actually blown away by the soft tissue healing, and from this moment, I started to implement vertical preparation technique in my daily practice. And this actually is a 30 years old uh, follow-up of my dad's uh, 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 crown, and, the, and you can see here from the patient that the patient has an extremely bad oral hygiene, and yet the soft tissue healing around the crown after 32 years, it was like, wow. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I have to. I didn't mention that my dad is a professor of uh, oral and maxillofacial surgery uh, 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 in uh, in uh, uh, in dental school. So yeah, it's like uh, I'm inheriting the, uh, the, uh, the the profession. And here's the occlusal view of the crown. Let's uh, go and scroll to some cases. Here, I did in the long treatment, and then I put a vertical crown, and here is the soft tissue after uh, uh, cementation, and here's the x-ray for the crown, and here's the soft tissue healing after one year, as you can see here. And here is after two years, it's, if you can see from here, from this, from this photo and to this photo, and after two years, the soft tissue healing is like this. This is really, really 
nice soft tissue healing. Another case. Here is another case. And let's see how I do the preparation. And here are the birds that we use for the... Here I'm starting by opening the uh, 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 opening the contacts first. Uh, putting a matrix to prevent any injury for the adjacent tooth. And then I'm doing you doing some depth cuts to uh, do the occlusal clearance. Guys, you can see you can see all these videos on my YouTube channel. Okay, uh, they are all there. And here, after doing the occlusal uh, reduction, I started using the bad burr. So basically, what I'm using, what I'm doing with the bad burr, that I'm not creating any finish line at all. It's safe and it doesn't cause or doesn't form any finish line in the first place. And I do the regular preparation for, for any crown. Just the only difference is that there is no finish line being formed. It's like what we do when we do the finish line is that when first we remove the height of contour and then you create your finish line. But here I just remove the height of contour. And that's how conservative you can have. And here you can see on the palatal surface and doing the same on the palatal end of course we do a roundation of the line angles here you can see that i have still an undercut uh, uh, labially on the buck on the buccal surface at the area of the of the forcation area so i remove the undercut so yeah, that's why you have to look from different angulations to make sure that there is no undercut and then going again with a butt burr to remove any form of finish line after I use the, uh, uh, the different burr. And then I did uh, polish the preparation to have a smoother uh, 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 surface architecture for the preparation and impression taking. And from the palatal surface. And then I did round the line angles and sharp line angles and point angles. Guys, if you, I, I want you to look carefully at this tooth stump, the amount of the tooth structure being still there. And here I'm just finishing the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, area at the uh, uh, forcation area. And then repolish it. And that is the final preparation. And here is just after one week of temporization, I, I just postpo postponed the impression thing after one year. And here's the soft tissue healing. And then we took the impression here we are showing the occlusion, the amount of occlusive clearance, just 1.5 millimeter. We took, we did a two-step impression using a polyvinyl saloxane.
And then we did a monolithic zirconia crowns, which is something I totally recommend for, uh, uh, for crowns. And here you can see the margins that are knife, being knife edged. Of course, uh, you can sometimes have a technical difficulty doing this margins uh, you, uh, using CAT CAM. So the CAT CAM uh, have a limit by making the margin thickness 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters. So you actually do the crown with an over uh, with an oversized margin, and then after centering, you do a, a, a round. You do a, 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 a remove the excess area using discs. Okay, so that's the sh the shape of the preparation. First step of impression. Second step, crown. The margins are knife edged, and here's after the, I did endodontic treatment and the x-ray for the cementation of the crown. And here's the cemented crown. And I want you to look extremely carefully at this area, okay? I did it to be self-cleansable, okay? Because it's a forcation area, I have to do it like two crowns. Not, it's like, like doing a concavity in between so, I, so it can be self-cleansable. And what is really interesting, and that's from the palatal view, the shape of the soft tissue after 10 months. Look at this. Look at the soft tissue creeping on the margin. This will never happen if this crown margin is not soft tissue friendly. If it's not a soft tissue friendly, it will never happen like this. The, actually, the soft tissue creep the area and close it, and it actually look really nice and really healthy. In other cases, here I had a 2 class 2. I did uh, endodontic treatment for the lower six and crown preparation using vertical preparation technique. And you can see here the amount of tooth structure that's being preserved. And we took impression at the same day. I Normally, I put Teflon in the sulcus and I took impression while the Teflon is in the sulcus. Uh, the Teflon will uh, make the impression not reaching uh, fully to the sulcus, which will prevent uh, uh, any impinging on the uh, uh, suprachrystal uh, 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 tissue attachment, and also it will uh, uh, decrease the amount of fluids in the sulcus uh, while impression taking, because it's hydrophobic material. Then I took the impression, and then I did temporization, and you can see here it's a uh, uh, um, it's a uh, uh, bees acrylic material. I did uh, um, mark the internal line here, as you can see. Then I trim the borders of the temporary crown like this to make it a knife edge. And then I temporary cement the temporary crown. Then I, this is after removal of the Teflon from the sulcus and the removing of the excess cement. And this is after just five days. Look at the soft tissue healing around the temporary crown, which is not that really nice crown because it's just a piece of acrylic and it's uh, really rough. It's not that really smooth uh, uh, crown, but yet the soft tissue healing was really nice. And here, after I removed the temporary crown, then I put a CAT CAM temporary crown as a, uh, um, you can say as a tester drive to check the contact, to check the occlusion and uh, uh, to, uh, to mold the soft tissue even better. And you can see the margins. And here's after putting the temporary crown, the CAT CAM, uh, PMMA crowns. And here's the uh, soft tissue healing around the temporary crown. And here's just after six days, you can look at the healing of the soft tissue and even from the palatal surface, even with the bad oral hygiene, actually. This patient doesn't ha didn't have a, a really nice oral hygiene to begin with, but really the soft tissue is really amazing. And then after removing of the uh, uh, crown, of the, of the temporary crown, Look at the soft tissue healing. And the actually the reddish area here, it's not an inflammation, it's the hemidesmosomes, which is a normal architecture within the fusion of the margin because it's not keratinized and at the at the uh, inner uh, inner part. And here is the preparate uh, the, the shape of the preparation and the shape of the stump. And you can see here that I have an merely an edge. If you can see that's an edge after it, there is a, a an undercut. 
but this is the where I end my margin. But the beauty of the uh, vertical preparation is that I simply can put the margin in this point or in this point or in this point without having any risk or having of having uh, an open margin because there is no margin. And here is the cat cam tempi crown. Uh, so uh, sorry, this is the uh, monolithic zirconia crown. And here's after cementation. And please look at the soft tissue healing around the crown. How does it look? And from the uh, palate uh, or the lingual view, and from the buccal view. And you can see here there is there is no uh, an over contouring on the crown. And here is after cementation. Another case, here we did a truss axis and we did pre endodontic buildup and then we finished the endodontic treatment and we put the composite and then we started the crown preparation. <coughs> so basically, why did I do a crown while I did already a truss axis? So teeth still deflect under crowns to a lesser degree, of course, but they still deflect. So if I can maximize the resistance form of the tooth structure beneath the crown, that's even more beneficial. So I did truss axis, yes, and then I did my crown preparation. And here's the edge that is formed. And then the uh, Biza acrylic temporary crown cementation. And that's the healing after a few days, like four or five days. And then after removing, you can see uh, 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 we, and we put the Teflon tape to take the impression. And here you can see the preparation and how you can see the amount of tooth structure being left there, which maximize the resistance form of the tooth. And then a two-step impression taking. Impression and then monolithic zirconia crown cementation and you can see from different angulation and you can see the response of the soft tissue healing around the crown is really beyond doubt. And here's after cementation. Another case, I had two uh, teeth. I did endodontic treatment. We do crown preparation for both, vertical crown preparation. You can see here the uh, uh, the preparation and what you can see here on the palatal it is not a finish line it's an edge you guys it's not a finish line and then uh, uh, impression taking and the shape of the uh, uh, of the cast the monolithic zirconia crowns and cementation and you can see here the soft tissue healing around the crowns after one week of cementation it's really really nice and on the palatal surface, you can see that the healing is really, really nice. And here is the x-ray for the after cementation. Another case, same thing. You can, guys, I'm just showing so many cases that it's something, it's a protocol that is being repeated over and over with really good outcome. Preparation, impression taking, crown uh, uh, fabrication, monolithic zirconia crown. You can see the margins here. Knife edge crowns and cementation and a close-up view for the soft tissue healing around the crown and a palatal view of the uh, 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 soft tissue healing around the crown and an occlusal view. Can we do this? Uh, from what I stated here, we did a lot of crown preparation uh, uh, um, uh, uh, for posterior teeth. Can we do it for anterior teeth? Actually, yes. Here, the aesthetics will be uh, of, a, of a great concern. Of course, this patient had a very, very bad oral hygiene. We had to do uh, uh, scaling and root planning in uh, many sessions. And then we do the endodontic treatment for the upper central and composite uh, restoration. And then we did the preparation phase. And you can see. And then we took and we did. Uh, 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 temporization and here is after a few days of temporization perhaps I should 
I should have uh, uh, made some, some gingivectomy here to make the zenith point, the zenith point at the same uh, area. And then we took the impression. That's a close-up view for the for the preparation after the healing. And here is the zirconia core, because I did here uh, I did a, a, a porcelain fused zirconia crown. And here is the close view of the crown of the of the of the core of the zirconia core and here uh, i was uh, showing the 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 lab the uh, the surface architecture the presence of loops and valleys so he can make it on the temp on the crown here you can see there is some soft tissue upset after, just because i took the photo immediately after cementation and unfortunately i couldn't have the patient again to see her but uh, uh, from what I saw, um, what I see, the soft tissue healing around these types of crowns is really, really nice. Here's a side view, and another side view, and an occlusal view, uh, a 12 o'clock view. So uh, let's see another case, uh, 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 which is here I did with a PFM crowns. I did it with porcelain fused to metal. Here the patient had uh, uh, a periapical lesion. We did an endontic treatment, and here I put calcium hydroxide, and then I did my endontic treatment, and from here I was doing an endontic retreatment. And actually, this is one of the main uh, uh, indications for doing a vertical crown preparation. If you are having an older crown like this, and you remove it, and you remove the old restoration, as in here, and you end up with a very, very thin uh, uh, tooth structure, and if you did a shoulder finish line or a deep chamfer finish line in such cases, as in here you can see, if you did a deep chamfer finish line, you will lose a lot of tooth structure. That's why in here, what I did was, I did a vertical crown preparation. And here is after healing, one week of healing. And then I took my impression. And then I made a PFM crown, but with a metal collar. The same thing with PFZ, we do it with a zirconia Color because you cannot make this the porcelain very thin at the margin, but you can make it with the metal. And then I repolished the metal surface, and that's immediately after cementation. And here is the palatal surface. You can see the gingiva is a little bit upset after cementation. And here is the uh, 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 crown after cementation. You can he see here that the periapical lesion is is beginning to heal. And here is after four month follow up. You can see that the papilla has breached the gap. Of course, there is some uh, a metal uh, a color display because it's 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 something uh, uh, it's something unavoidable. It's a it's a crown. It's a PFM crown. Uh, the patient couldn't afford to do an old ceramic crown, so that's a really a, a really uh, a nice healing around the crown. And even from the palatal surface, the healing was really really good. And from the X-ray, you can see that the uh, periapical lesion was already healing. Okay, another case, here is the uh, uh, crown preparation, crown fabrication, and here is the cementation of the crown. And after one year follow-up, the soft tissue healing is really, really magnificent. So trust me, it really works. Uh, uh, so what is the take-home message from this presentation? Number one, preserving tooth structure is paramount to increase the survival rate of endontically treated teeth. It's all about conservatism, guys. Preserving pericervical dentine from inside by using narrower taper files and from the outside using chamfer or vertical preparation. Guys, I'm not saying you should do vertical preparation for every case, but in, in cases that's truly, that's truly indicated, you should go for it. Uh, uh, chamfer is not that bad. Vertical, for me, is even better because I maximize the resistance form of the tooth structure. Using magnification will make you will make you more conservative during endodontic treatment and even during crown preparation. So I really advocate for using magnification, whether a dental operating microscope or dental loops. That's really, really, really important. Ferrule and ferrule effect are more important than using posts. But if the ferrule is compromised, you should go for cast metal posts rather than fiber posts. Rather, fiber posts are not recommended when ferrule, especially on the uh, functional cusp, is 
uh, 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 is compromised. We as dentists are striving to do more when we must do less. We must do, or we should do, more conservative access so it's less cavity preparation and mecha a mechanical preparation less with less taper fire so it's less preparation and performing cuspal coverage with less thickness for finish line. So do not go for more, go for less. Uh, thank you. And I hope you like the presentation and I'm gonna ask the questions right now. Uh, okay, let's look at the uh, 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 questions for uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Neeraj uh, kindly. He did uh, uh, a good job by uh, bringing the, uh, the questions in one place. So a doctor from doctor, uh, uh, and guys, please, uh, I, I already, I, uh, I have to apologize if I misread the names. Uh, I really apologize for this. So please don't take it uh, offensively, okay? Uh, so Dr. Shirayas, uh, 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 won't we get bulky crowns in case of vertical prep? That's a really nice question. Uh, sometimes we get bulky preps. That's why we can we 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 do something here, and I forgot to mention. I'm going to show you right now. Yes, here, uh, Doctor Shrias, please uh, uh, bear with me. Look at this. Look at the step that I did here. Okay. This step on the occlusal table, we call it uh, uh, inverted shoulder preparation. So what I did here is basically I make room for the crown so I do not create an over contoured crown, okay? So your question is really important. It happens uh, uh, if, you, if you are doing vertical preparation on, uh, 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 on sound tooth structure, yeah, if, if you did an endodontic treatment uh, and the tooth is fairly sound, you have this problem. But if the tooth is already compromised and you do the crown, and do the crown preparation uh, 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 on a compromised core, let's say, then you, you won't have this kind of a problem. But if the, if the tooth is already sound, you might end up with an over contoured crown. So you 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 stop this uh, uh, by making an inverted shoulder, as I as I'm showing here in this photo. Okay. Okay. Another question, Doctor uh, Tejas. Uh, uh, sometimes the patient experiences pain when the miracle mix is restored as POR and no difference is observed when high points and overhanging is taken care of. Why do it happen? Uh, Merigal Max is restored. Uh, may I ask about the Merigal Max? Are you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you talking about the, the, uh, the, uh, the glass ionomer Merigal Max? Uh, Dr. Dr. Neeraj, are you there? If you can put uh, 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 the, uh, the comments on the, uh, on the presentation, it's an option on the stream yard. You can do it, I think. Okay, I'm gonna move move on to the next question until I have a, 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 an explanation for this point. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kumar, uh, don't you think in trust access cases after cleaning underneath and leaving unsupported tooth structure are more liable to get fractured in due, due, co uh, in due course dot? Okay, okay, Doc. Um, when you're having a trust access, you're having a dentin and the dentin is the predominantly supporting the tooth structure. So the question is this, if you're already having undermined tooth structure under the truss, we are having an undermined tooth structure in normal teeth because already you are, we are having a pulp chamber inside the, tooth, inside the tooth itself. So you can consider that this part is undermined. No, it's not because you have dentin and the dentin giving you the support, okay? So this part, if it's very thin, it's like 0.5 millimeters or one millimeter, yeah, I would say so. But if I'm having like a two millimeter or a 2.5 and the depth is like 2.2 millimeters, this is a very good, this is a very good. And actually, if we are going to, to talk about this, in my belief that the truss is even more important than the marginal ridge. So basically, if you look at the anatomy of the tooth, you are having that the marginal ridge is predominantly made of enamel, not dentin. And what is mainly for, mainly predominantly doing the support is the dentin not the enamel. So actually the marginal ridges can get cracked. It happens a lot, right? Uh, 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 and the marginal ridge is predominantly made of enamel, not dentin. Okay, uh, another question from Dr. Laxman. Uh, 
uh, in case of cast post gap between cast post and epical get persia should be present or not but in fiber case gap between fiber post remaining get persia not required uh, you mean uh, you, so you mean that there is sometimes there is a gap between the uh, uh, get persia and the post okay uh, as long as you have a good coronal seal dot you don't have any problem i mean you have cemented your post you have did your crown around uh, uh, around the crown and you have a good seal a good ad marginal adaptation and a good sealing you don't you won't you won't end up with any problem even if there is a gap between uh, uh, even if there is a small gap between the post and the gutta persia normally we don't like to have any any gap but if it's there and you did good coronal seal you don't have any problem Actually, guys, it's all about the coronal seed. It is far more important. It's really, really important to have a coronal seed. Of course, the 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 the, uh, uh, um, the uh, epical seal is important, but the coronal seal is paramount. If you if you're having uh, a good epical seal, but you have a compromised coronal seal, you still have a compromised treatment, and sometimes you need to do retreatment of the endodontic treatment, right? Okay, uh, Doctor uh, Singh. Uh, Subgingival finish line. How to decide for biological width? Sometimes can encroach. Uh, sometimes it can, it can encroach the biological width. It's a very good question, Doc. Uh, so basically, what I said when I took the impression, I I do. Uh, uh, um, I like to put is a uh, um, a Teflon inside the sulcus. So if I put Teflon inside the sulcus, uh, uh, I prevent from the beginning the impression from reaching the depth of the sulcus so the crown margin will always be shorter than the sulcus and you won't end up with a problem all right okay i'm with you guys mm -hmm. another question um doctor uh, tool Montaha, edgeless and shoulderless is the, the same thing. Look, uh, um, they are not the same thing. They are slightly different. So the edge preparation is you have an edge and below this edge is an undercut. So your crown cannot pass the edge. It can be shorter than the edge, but it cannot pass the edge. All right. But in the edgeless approach, you are having a convert or a, an occlusal convergence from the uh, 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 occlusal table up to the level of bone. And we do this in cases of compromised furrow, okay? Doctor uh, 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 Swanil Bajat, uh, tips on how to prepare teeth under rubber dam. Okay, uh, basically, look, we do split dam, right? Uh, uh, you, if I'm going to prepare a uh, upper six, I'm gonna put a, 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 a wingless clamp on the seven and make uh, uh, a window from the canine up to the seven, and uh, we call it a split dam, okay? And you can do the crown preparation afterwards, if you want to. Sometimes you cannot, you, you may not have to use rubber dam for it, but if, if, if it gives you better retraction and protection of other oral tissues, of course, go for it. From uh, Dr. Uh, Komar, uh, uh, do you do the temporization in every case? Of course, of course I do temporization in every case. Uh, even if I'm gonna, if I'm not going to put, uh, 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 if I'm not gonna put temporary crown, I sometimes I put flowable composite in between teeth and on the occlusal table to prevent uh, uh, movement of adjacent teeth and movement of the opposing tooth because sometimes it happens even as fast as few hours. So you have to make sure that the tooth that you prepared is in the same position when you deliver your crown. Uh, Dr. Uh, Diouf Ali, cementation of vertical crown will cement irritation. Gingiva, any precautions during cementation? Um, all right. Sometimes I'm going to tell you this. Uh, um, I I remember a, a guy that he was using Teflon, and then he did uh, uh, and he do uh, uh, the cementation. He he was Dr. Massimo Maza. Uh, may uh, God rest his, his soul in peace. Uh, uh, he was. Putting, he, he used to put uh, uh, Teflon on the sulcus and then he cement the crown and then after uh, cementation he removed the Teflon from the sulcus 
uh, and it took the excess cement. Uh, normally, I use magnification and I use uh, 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 um, mainly I use magnification and I inspect, I thoroughly inspect the margins after uh, cementation and I remove the uh, uh, cement, the excess cement under magnification. So uh, uh, it might also be helpful. Okay, I think I, I've answered all the questions. If anyone else have any question, we, you can contact me on uh, on my Facebook uh, account uh, or uh, uh, via message or on this video. I'm gonna look at the video every once in a while to uh, uh, answer any further questions, okay? Um, I will start. I will try to go on Facebook to see if you have any uh, 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 other questions. Okay, guys, uh, um, I hope you like the presentation and I hope you uh, um, uh, have you, uh, you, you benefit from the presentation and uh, let's see you uh, uh, one day in real life and I hope so. Um, thank you and uh, uh, goodbye.